everyone. My name is John Davis. I'm an astronomer at the UK Astronomy Technology Centre at the beautiful Royal Observatory in Edinburgh. Uh, I'm a staff astronomer, so I should speak, I should, should say that I'm speaking as a user of satellites rather than someone who actually uh, builds them or designs them, although I have over the years uh, been involved in both using and making various satellites, uh, mostly astronomy satellites, which will feature in the talk. And some years ago, I also wrote this uh, book about how satellites are used for astronomy. Don't worry, I'm not trying to sell it to you. It's been out of print for years. But um, so that's where I'm coming from. I'm coming to this as a user of astronomy satellites. And I'm going to talk about why we put different kinds of satellites in different kinds of orbits. So my unofficial title for this is ever decreasing circles because stuff that goes up into space generally comes down again by spiraling inwards. Uh, the origin of this talk is that it was given to the engineering staff at the Royal Observatory Edinburgh uh, so that if they found themselves working on space projects, they would at least have some idea about uh, orbital mechanics uh, and dynamics and how we choose different orbits for different kinds of missions. But what I'm going to start by doing uh, is just to make sure everyone's on the same page, is just to define a few uh, simple expressions. So some of you are experienced in this stuff may already know these things, but I want to put everyone on the same page. So where does space actually start? And the answer is surprisingly close to where we are. Um, I live in Edinburgh, my daughter lives in Carlisle, and space is actually closer to me than my daughter in Carlisle. There are several definitions of where space begins. The United States Air Force uh, used 50 miles, which is 80 kilometers. Uh, possibly because it's a nice round number, possibly because it was achievable by their X-15 rocket plane, which enabled USAF pilots to be given astronauts' wings in competition with the Mercury astronauts who were flying for NASA. A more widely uh, accepted definition is the so-called von Kármán line, which is the point at which the air, the air is so thin that normal wings and aerodynamic control surfaces don't work again. Now that's a bit of a, a bit of a variable feast. It depends on the density of the atmosphere at the time, but it's about 100 kilometers, and that's a nice round number, uh, and that's the limit that uh, people used and was used as the uh, goal for the X prize, X prize to put a passenger plane into space, and that's what uh, will be used by Virgin Galactic if they get their Virgin uh, Galactic suborbital space tourism on the go. Um, if you actually want to stay in orbit, though, 100 kilometers is still a bit too low. So you really need to be up around 150 kilometers. Uh, at that point, you can stay in orbit, albeit for only a few uh, hours or days. There is a few uh, technical definitions of orbits. We call the angle between the orbital plane and the equator of the Earth the inclination. And we call the furthest point away from the Earth, the apogee, and we call the closest point to the Earth, the perigee. And if you have trouble remembering that, apogee and away both begin with A. So the apogee is when the satellite is furthest away uh, from the Earth. The inclination is important because depending on where you're launching from, to, uh, to get the best orbit you can, you want to launch due east, and you finish up in an orbit which is equal to your uh, latitude. So for a given uh, launch site, uh, the best, the most efficient thing is to launch into an orbit which puts you into an inclination equal to your latitude. So the early American space flights like the Gemini uh, missions uh, were in an inclination of 28.5 because that's the latitude of Cape Canaveral. Uh, the European Space Agency and Ariane Spass chose uh, uh, to build a launch station at Kourou in, in South America because that's near the equator and they guessed that the most commercial flights would want to put satellites into equatorial orbits for reasons we'll see in a minute. Um, and you also have to think about if you launch, where is your first and second stage is going to land? So if you try to launch into an orbit over the poles from Cape Canaveral, uh, your upper stages are going to land on the east coast of the United States or in South America, which isn't very uh, sensible. So orbits into polar orbits tend to be from the Vandenberg Air Force Base, which is number one on this diagram, on the west coast of America. Uh, if you want to get around these problems, you can uh, launch from an airplane, which is going to take off and position itself anywhere and point itself in any direction when it launches. The illustration is the Pegasus rocket being launched from a, a TriStar airplane. The Pegasus is, is pretty much out of service now, but 
Virgin Space have just started to experiment with dropping liquid fuel rockets from a jumbo jet, which will give them this uh, very flexible launch opportunity uh, when they get it uh, operational. So in Midsummer Night's Dream, uh, William Shakespeare says he will, has one of his characters say he will put a girdle around the earth in 40 minutes, but actually that's almost impossible because this table shows how the orbital period varies with altitude. And you'll see that in any orbital orbit of a height of about 100 kilometers or upwards, it takes about an hour and a half to go around the earth. Even at 10 kilometers, it would take you 80 minutes. And of course, you can't orbit the earth that low because you're in the atmosphere. So this table shows the uh, orbital height and the orbital period that you get at those different heights. And for most low Earth orbits, I say it's about a couple of hundred to a thousand kilometers, and the orbital period is about an hour and a half. If we go higher, the orbital period gets longer until we reach this magic uh, value of, of about 36,000 kilometers, when the orbital period is exactly equal to the rotation period of the Earth. And that's what we call a geostationary orbit. You also have to bear in mind that the atmosphere is, is a major factor if you're in low Earth orbit. Even at 100 or 200 kilometers, there's enough atmosphere to create drag, which will slow your spacecraft down and cause orbital decay. Uh, if you go up to 1,000 kilometers, your orbit is probably stable for about 1,000 years. And in the geostationary ring, the orbital period is stable, is stable for millions of years. There's one exception to this, and that is an ESA satellite, uh, which did operate at a very low altitude, but it did that by constantly using an ionic thruster to just give it gentle accelerations to overcome uh, the drag from the atmosphere. And you also have to bear in mind that the atmosphere is not a stable thing. It puffs up and comes down depending on the solar cycle. So the atmosphere is not a constant uh, drag force. It varies depending on other, other things. If we go a little bit higher above the atmosphere, you run into these Van Allen belts. These are donut shaped belts of radiation charged particles, mostly electrons, uh, which were discovered originally by the Explorer 1 satellite and uh, Dr. James Van Allen. Uh, these are bad news for satellites because they're highly charged particles. They can interfere with your spacecraft and electronics. They can cause bit flips in your computers. So they are best avoided. The International Space Station operates below the Van Allen belts. Um, uh, most other satellites try to operate either above them or below them because operating in them is quite difficult. And there's a special region called the South Atlantic Anomaly, which is a bit of the uh, inner Van Allen belt, which is at a relatively low altitude. So it dips below a thousand uh, kilometers and it's logically enough uh, over the South Atlantic. Ground trace is just an expression we use to map out the path of the satellite over a map of the Earth. Uh, so it's just a 2D representation of, of a three-dimensional thing. And you get this classic S shape uh, for an, an orbit which is inclined to the equator. And this is what uh, the, co the combined ground track uh, for several orbits of a satellite in low Earth orbit looks like. Uh, you see it goes up to uh, a latitude which is at the maximum of, it, of its inclination, it comes down to that same inclination and it, it sweeps across the Earth uh, as the Earth turns underneath it. It's important to understand that the orbit is fixed in space, in inertial space relative to the stars. Once the satellite's up there, it doesn't care what the Earth is doing. So the orbit is essentially fixed in space and the Earth is rotating underneath that orbit, which is what causes the ground trace uh, to move from side to side. So that's the that's just some basic definitions. Many of you BIS members are probably familiar with all of this stuff uh, already. But uh, so now let's talk about how uh, we use these different orbits for different kinds uh, of space missions. So when you think about astronomy satellites, probably the first thing that comes into your head is the Hubble Space Telescope. And the Hubble Space Telescope uh, is in low Earth orbit. Uh, and you might think that must be because it's a good place, but actually it's not. Uh, uh, low Earth orbit is an, is an awful place to do space astronomy. Uh, for one thing, you, you uh, have frequent eclipses. So as the satellite, the space telescope goes behind the Earth, the solar power is cut off. Uh, that means you have to have large batteries to keep your satellite alive while you're in the Earth's shadow. It also means you can't point at anything for any long uh, period because most of the time 
you'll be locked onto it and the earth will get in the way and you'll have to go look somewhere else and then wait and reacquire your first target when you come back around uh, from the backside of the earth. About half of the sky is physically blocked. When you're in low earth orbit, half of the sky is actually blocked by the earth. Um, and it, in addition to that, you have the stray light from the upper atmosphere, which, which uh, also restricts your pointing directions. You have a high uh, thermal load. You've got the sun shining on you from one side and then the earth shining. It's radiating warmth up to you from underneath and reflecting light from you from underneath. And even when you're on the dark side of the earth, you still have a large thermal uh, load because the earth is warm. So it's radiating lots of heat up at you. So you have this constantly changing background of both visible light and thermal radiation, none of which is good uh, for telescope stability and stuff like that. But why do we put anything in a low Earth orbit? Well, I was reluctant to use the word easily to talk about putting anything into space, but low Earth orbit is easy, relatively easily accessible. Um, and of course, the Hubble telescope was designed to be serviced on orbit by astronauts. So it had to be something that could be reached by the space shuttle. So Hubble goes into low Earth orbit because that's the only place it can possibly be put if it's going to be serviced. This low Earth orbit is also popular for small, cheap missions like CubeSats. Now, these are very small things the size of shoeboxes or smaller even. Um, and low Earth orbit is mostly below uh, the Van Allen belt, so you don't have too much of, of a problem with radiation, provided you don't go high enough to wander into the South Atlantic anomaly. Now, I said a few minutes ago that the orbit of a satellite is fixed in space relative to the stars, and that would be true if the Earth was exactly circular. But of course, it's not. The Earth has an equatorial bulge. It's slightly pear-shaped. And this means that the gravitational field experienced by a satellite as it orbits the planet is slightly variable. And it does mean that if you're clever, you can choose your orbit in such a way that the orbit will drift around the Earth. And you can choose an orbit which will drift at about one degree per day. Now it's 360 degrees in a circle, there's 365 days in a year. So if you pick the right orbit, the satellite will drift around the Earth at just the same rate that the Earth goes around the sun. So the Earth-Sun angle will remain the same. And this is what's called a sun-synchronous orbit. And here's an example of one. Uh, this is actually the IRAS satellite which, on which I worked uh, many years ago. You'll see that it's going round uh, on the dividing line, the terminator between day and night, uh, and the Earth is simply turning underneath it. And as the Earth goes around the sun, the satellite will stay on this day-night terminator because its orbit is drifting at the same rate that the Earth is going around the sun. So IRAS was uh, an all-sky survey. It was done from low Earth orbit because that was basically the only orbit that could be reached in 1983. And it was actually my first uh, ever job as a space astronomer. It was a relatively small telescope, just 60 centimeters, but it was sitting inside a large uh, Dewar flask containing superfluid helium. Now the helium was there because IRAS had to be operated in a very cold state. It was only a couple of degrees above absolute zero. Uh, the trouble with that was because it was close to the earth, there was a lot of heat load from the earth onto the satellite and that was boiling away uh, the helium. So the lifetime was quite short. In the end, it was about 10 months uh, before the helium uh, boiled away and the satellite warmed up and stopped working. This artist's impression from uh, the SDFC, the SRC, as it was in those days, press kit, um, shows IRAS flying over the UK on that day-night Terminator uh, because the ground station was at the Rutherford and Appleton Laboratory in Oxfordshire. IRAS used to fly over RAL about uh, twice a day about 12 hours apart, and each flyover lasted about eight minutes. So we had eight minutes in which to download 12 hours worth of data and upload 12 hours worth of new instructions. And then uh, if we missed the first pass, we'd sometimes get a second one, but then the satellite would be out of contact for 10 or 12 hours until the air had rotated underneath it enough that we could see it again. So this is a, an example of why a low Earth orbit is not a good place to be. Uh, especially if you're using cryogens. Uh, the cryogens boil away and you can only talk to your ground station for a few minutes every 12 hours or so. Now, IRAS chose such an orbit. It was quite a clever design. In 1983, we didn't have infrared CCD type detectors. IRAS had lots of separate individual 
uh, semiconductor bricks, uh, which would light up when an infrared source tracked across them. So IRS was designed to scan the sky and the black arrow shows the uh, direction that a source would take and you'd see it, it would fly across the focal plane and it would illuminate some of those detectors. And the RS orbit was chosen so that after one orbit, the precession was such that the, sh that the field of view had shifted by half a field of the telescope. So when you came across the same bit of sky again, the same star flew down a different path across the focal plane and you could confirm its reality because you'd seen it twice on two different orbits, uh, lighting up different detectors. And what happened was as the orbit scanned across the sky and the earth turned around the sun. It meant that IRS could sweep out the whole sky uh, over a period of six months. And then it began to repeat the survey uh, in the second six months of the mission. Unfortunately, uh, the helium didn't last quite long enough for it to do everything uh, twice. Now this uh, polar sun synchronous orbit has been used by similar uh, infrared satellite missions subsequently, most notably the uh, wide field infrared spectroscopic explorer WISE, who recently reincarnated as NEO WISE, uh, which detected the comet that's been visible in the sky recently, and the Japanese space agency Astro F mission named Akari once it was in orbit. These were both uh, all sky surveys in the infrared, so they used IRAS type polar sun synchronous uh, orbits. Now, sun synchronous orbits are also useful for Landsat satellites, which are used for environmental monitoring. Because they're in the polar orbit, they travel across the whole of the Earth's surface sooner or later as the Earth turns underneath them. Uh, but there's another big advantage, and that is that uh, the sun angle is pretty much the same. So the ground track repeats, and it, and it repeats at the same sun angle on each pass. Now, that makes comparisons from one orbit to the next much easier. If, for example, you're measuring the height of a building uh, by measuring its shadow, it helps a lot if you don't have to worry about whether the sun angle is the same. So if you want to watch things changing, you don't have to worry about changing sun angles, confusing the issue. It's, you, get reasonably good image quality, you get reasonably good image quality because you're fairly low down, a uh, thousand kilometers or so, but you do get this problem of low persistence. You, you're only over a particular point on the earth for a few minutes. Um, that means as with the case of IRS, you only have a few minutes uh, of time to communicate with your satellite before it uh, disappears. But on the other hand, you don't need a very big transmitter because that spacecraft is quite close to the Earth. So these sorts of synchronous, uh, sun synchronous orbits are good for agriculture monitoring, your fields changing, looking for crop disease if, this, if the spectral characteristics of the field change because of being infected. Urban planning, cities don't change very much on the time scale of a day. Um, environmental monitoring, pollution, that sort of thing, strategic military reconnaissance, how many airfields has, has somebody got, where is his ship? Um, but it's not so good if you want real-time information where things change quickly, such as air traffic control, where airplanes are moving uh, quickly, or actual battlefield management, where, where in an hour and a half, the situation could have changed a great deal. If you want better persistence, that is to say better coverage, uh, you can do it by using constellations of similar satellites, uh, and that has both pluses and minuses, um, as we'll see. So the first people to use this was the Iridium communication satellite. This was a mobile system, and they put many satellites in many orbital planes, so in theory, something always visible. But as you may know, a few years ago, well, 10 years ago now, one of these Iridium satellites uh, had an actual collision with the Cosmos, a derelict Cosmos satellite, and the, the, there was a collision. The both satellites were destroyed, and they put about a ton and a half between them. They weighed a ton and a half, so that's a ton and a half of debris uh, now orbiting the Earth in roughly the same orbits that the satellites were in to start with. And what you rapidly run into here is a problem which we call the Kessler effect, and it's a kind of runaway chain reaction because you generate a lot of debris, the debris then hits other satellites and can create yet more debris. So there is going to be a problem in the near future if we have too many of these satellite collisions because we're going to surround the Earth with a ring of debris, which is going to make it difficult to operate new satellites if we can't somehow clean up uh, all of this debris. And this is becoming much more of an issue because 
uh, Iridium constellation was only about 100 satellites. But the new generation uh, of satellite constellations involved literally thousands of satellites. And these are particularly used for broadband internet. Now, one of the problems with the broadband internet is you need low latency. That is to say, you can't have your signal taking a long time to get up to the satellites and get back down again because the speed of light is finite. Um, so the best way to minimize that latency is to put the satellite in low Earth orbit. But if it's in low Earth orbit, you have to have lots of satellites because they don't stay in view very often. You also need to have enough that wherever you are on the Earth, even if there are things like mountains and buildings in the way, uh, you can still see a satellite. So the solution is to put literally thousands uh, of satellites into low Earth orbit. And that's a problem both for the space environment, the collision thing. Uh, it's also a problem for astronomy because Starlink is launching satellites dozens at a time. And certainly when they're on their way to their operational orbit, this is what happens. You take a deep uh, image of the sky, you get many, many streaks of light as the Starlink satellites fly through it. Now, to be fair to the Starlink people, they are aware of this problem and they are doing uh, their best to mitigate it. But uh, as an opticalist or an infrared astronomer, uh, the idea of having all of my pictures ruined by constellations of satellites is not uh, a happy thought. If we move up a bit, there's not that very, there's not much use for this so-called medium Earth orbit, uh, periods of about 12 hours, but it is where the global positioning system, the Navstar satellites, uh, our position. Uh, this is a constellation of 24 satellites. There's six orbital planes involved, four satellites in each, uh, in each orbital plane. Uh, and they're in orbits which repeat every 12 hours or so. Now, these are used for navigation. You probably think of them as the device that's in your car or your phone that helps you find your way to the shops or helps the delivery man bring you your parcel. But they were originally designed uh, for military purposes. So if you were special forces dropping into the jungle or driving across the desert or in a nuclear submarine somewhere in the South Atlantic, you needed to know accurately where you were. So uh, the idea is there are, are enough satellites that are always several of them visible to you and you can triangulate on the known positions of the satellites and thus figure out where you were on the Earth's surface. If we go up a little bit further, we finish up in this geostationary orbit, which I spoke about briefly at the beginning. This is where the orbital period of the satellite is 23 hours and 56 minutes. And that's how long it takes the Earth to rotate on its axis. So what that means is if you put a satellite in orbit around the equator at this altitude, it will appear to hover above a fixed spot on the Earth. Uh, this idea was first put up by Arthur C. Clarke, of course. Uh, in his famous article in the radio about radio relays in space. And so sometimes this geostationary orbit is called a Clark orbit. If you have three satellites spaced out at 120 degrees, you can in principle talk to almost the whole of the Earth using just those three satellites. Um, it's not so good near the poles, but it's over most of the land that people actually live in. Uh, it's pretty good. And the obvious uses for these things are for communication satellites. They were originally used for by Intelsat uh, for, for phone communications. More recently, uh, they're used for direct broadcast satellites like Sky TV and so on. I'm sure you've all got them, little dishes on the side of your house, the size of a tea tray, uh, pointing at a fixed point in space. That's where the direct broadcast satellites are. are, are. Uh, they are also used by the TDRS, the data relay satellites, which NASA use. Uh, these are used to talk to satellites in low Earth orbit uh, to re remove the need for NASA to have ground stations all over the Earth. And since the ISS, the International Space Station, is in a low Earth orbit, the TDRS satellites are also used to talk, uh, to communicate with the space station. So let's go back to astronomy here. We talked about survey missions earlier on, but astronomers are also interested in pointed missions where you can look at something for a long time. Uh, this is the European Infrared Space Observatory. I worked on this. I helped build some of the optics for it. Uh, it was a European uh, space observatory which operated for about three years in the late 1990s. It was very like IRAS. It was a 60 centimeter telescope inside a huge dewer of liquid helium. But unlike IRAS, instead of scanning the sky, you wanted something that could point at a fixed uh, spot in space for many minutes or even hours. Uh, so they had to choose a different orbit. 
preferably one away from the Earth, so that that helium would last a lot longer. And this is the orbit which they chose. It's a highly elliptical orbit, uh, very close to the geostationary transfer orbit, which is used to send those communication satellites up to the Clark orbit. And what happens here is the satellite starts uh, at this point, which is zero hours. It's close to the Earth's surface. It's inside the radiation belt, but it then climbs away from the Earth, out of the Van Allen belts. And it, ho and it takes a long time to get from that point that's about four hours to about 20 hours, which so spends a long period in roughly the same patch of sky, out of the radiation belts, inside of a ground station, uh, and it can point for many hours at a single target in space. Of course, eventually it drops into the uh, radiation belts again. At the same time, it drops below the horizon of the ground station at Via Franca in Spain. But you wouldn't want to make observations while you're in the radiation belts anyway, because the stray electrons will scramble your detectors. So you get the best of both worlds. Uh, you can talk to the spacecraft from a single ground station for about 20 hours per day, and the other four hours aren't much use anyway. Uh, so this, is, this sort of orbit is used for uh, large space observatories that want to make long uninterrupted pointings, and not just infrared missions. Uh, the two big X-ray missions, Chandra and the ESA, X-ray multi-mirror telescope, Newton, are both in these highly eccentric orbits, which allow long, uninterrupted pointings uh, for astronomy. There's a couple of other types of orbits uh, that, that, that are useful. One of them is the one used by the now long defunct but highly successful International Ultraviolet Observatory. Uh, IUE was placed in this 42 by 26,000 kilometer orbit. And it does have a period of 24 hours. So it's geosynchronous, but it's not in the plane of the equator. So it's not geostationary. And you can see on the bottom picture that it actually executes a figure of eight track from the west coast of the United States uh, down south over South America. And the reason this mission uh, profile was chosen was that RUE was an international project between Europe and America. And for part of the time, the satellite is visible from the European ground station in the Via Franca in southern Spain. Uh, and for the rest of the time, it's visible uh, from the Goddard Space Flight Center in the United States. So the Europeans would get their eight hour shift and then the satellite would drift out of communications with Via Franca, but into communications with Goddard. And the Americans would then get their 18, their 16 hour shift. And by the time their 16 hours was over, the orbit had drifted back into contact with Via Franca and the Europeans could take over again. And IUE never failed. It was still a fully operational when it was eventually shut down simply because it had run out of things to look at. Uh, its technology was just out of date and it had looked at everything that was bright enough for it to see. Here's another example of a highly eccentric orbit. This is the so-called Molnir orbit, which is used by the uh, Soviet Union's, now the Russians. Uh, Geostationary orbits are fine, but they're not very good if you live in, in highly northern or southern latitudes. Now, a lot of the Soviet Union, Russia, is a very high latitude. And, and from there, geostationary satellites are very near the horizon. So the Russians developed this system of launching into a, a highly elliptical orbit, which like ISO, although this time it's inclined at 65 degrees rather than being in the equator. So this satellite climbs from its low altitude into uh, visibility from Russian ground stations. And it then takes many hours to drift up to Apogee and then fall down again. So although you still have to track it, it's not moving very quickly and you can get many hours of relatively uninterrupted coverage. And the system is designed so that just as one satellite starts to disappear below the horizon, another one rises and you'll, you then swing your dish across to pick up the new rising satellite, follow that for, 10 or 12 hours, and as that starts to disappear, you tune into another one. So this, these highly elliptical, highly inclined orbits are often called Monia orbits, because that was the name of the Russian communication satellite uh, that first used them. Now, going back to astronomy and to yet another kind of orbit for astronomy missions, I, I need to talk a little bit of history here. So after the IRAS mission, the NASA planned to fly a thing called the Shuttle Infrared Telescope Facility, uh, or CERTA. And this was originally designed as an attached payload which would sit in the Space Shuttle cargo bay. Uh, 
It's cryogenically cooled, so it's got liquid helium to make it very cold. And to test out the environment, they flew on Space Lab 2, a small infrared te telescope called the Space Lab IRT. And what this showed beyond any doubt was that the space shuttle was a terrible place to do infrared astronomy. Not only is it in low Earth orbit, not only is it hot, but the space shuttle is, is outgassing all kinds of material from the cargo bay, gases, vapors, there's the thrust of firings, there's the, there's the water generated by the crew, which is dumped overboard. And, and so the whole shuttle is surrounded by a cloud of debris, which makes it a very bad place to do infrared astronomy. So CERTEF evolved into a free flying mission in low Earth orbit. The problem with that is in low Earth orbit, you have to have a lot of helium and it wasn't possible to make CERTEF last for the five year design without uh, being topped up. So the NASA considered a plan that the shuttle would fly up and recover CERTEF from time to time and reload the thing with liquid helium. And to prove that this concept would work, they had a mission called Shoot, which was a superfluid helium on orbit transfer in which astronauts, this was on STS-57 in 1993, in which astronauts went into the cargo bay and performed a spacewalk to, to simulate transferring helium from one tank to another to see if they could sensibly refuel uh, and, and re-top up the coolant of an uh, infrared satellite in low Earth orbit. Well, to make a long story short, that's not the way they went. They decided that they this was too complicated, too expensive. Shuttle missions were going to be fewer than expected. So CERTEF tried to evolve into being uh, a free-flying mission, which would not require resupply. And the first version, uh, it's the so-called Titan version, which was in vogue around about 1990. This was a huge thing because it had to carry a five-year supply of uh, liquid helium. It was so big it could only be launched by a Titan rocket. Titan's a very large rocket, very expensive, too expensive. So it was redesigned uh, to try and get it to fit on a, an Atlas rocket, which is cheaper. Um, but of course, it finished up being smaller. And even then, it was too expensive. So they had to re evolve again. Uh, and they produced this so called Delta version of CERTEF. And they made two changes here. One of them was in the cooling system, and one was in the orbit. So the cooling system, instead of putting the whole thing into a tank of liquid helium, they adopted an idea of letting the telescope cool down by itself and only carrying helium to cool the scientific instruments. And to make that small supply of helium last, uh, they had to get it away from the Earth. So they put it into this so-called heliocentric Earth trailing orbit. Now, this is basically you just take it to the to the Earth's orbit, just give it a gentle push. So it's almost still in Earth. It's almost in the same orbit around the, the sun as the Earth. It's just gradually drifting away, gradually being left behind. Um, and this has a lot of advantages for infrared space astronomy. The, you get rid of all the thermal and stray light background from the Earth. Because the Earth is no longer in the way, you can point over almost all of the sky, except in the direction of the sun. It's good for power because there's no eclipses. It's constantly illuminated by the sun. Um, but it does get harder to communicate because as it drifts away from the Earth, uh, the, the, the range gets greater every year. So CERTEF was finally launched in this configuration. Uh, and it was after launch, it was renamed Spitzer after Lyman Spitzer, a space astronomer who had done a lot of early work about space telescopes. So it had some cryogens, and the telescope itself was cooled radiatively. Uh, the mission was launched in August of 2003. The helium lasted about six years. Um, once the helium ran out, the, some of the detectors would still actually work. So they continued to operate the spacecraft until the beginning of this year when they finally switched it off. The same orbit, the same Earth trailing orbit is used by Kepler, which is a planet finding mission. I mean, Kepler is not cooled. Uh, but it does need to point at the same patch of sky all of the time to look for planet transits. Um, so this, this Earth trailing orbit uh, issues for that as well. Now I mentioned passive cooling briefly in the context of CERTEF, but this is something which is quite close to uh, my heart because in the 1990s, uh, we at the Royal Observatory, notably a chap called Tim Harden, thought about ISO particularly and thought, well, this helium stuff is, 
not a good plan because the helium boils away very quickly. So how about you build a satellite in which you take all those helium tanks out and you put some extra radiators in and you let the telescope cool down by itself. Now this is called passive cooling or radiative cooling. And we proposed a, a mission called Quiro, the Passively Cooled Orbiting Infrared Observatory Telescope to ESA as a medium sized mission in about May, 1990, in about 1990. Uh, it wasn't selected, ISO was in full development at that point, but we joined up with some other people and continued to develop it. So we came back in 93 with this version called Edison, which is a two and a half meter telescope, radiatively cooled, and the question is where to put it. Now, uh, a chap called John Barrow at British Aerospace said, why don't you put it in an L2 orbit? Um, and Rob Farquhar, who is a well-known well American mission designer, uh, can find you a way of getting into this L2 orbit without using a lot of rocket power. Uh, so that was how uh, Edison evolved. In fact, Edison was never selected. It was never built. But some of its legacy lives on both in the radiative cooling in the CERTEF mission and in another mission I'll talk about in a second. What is this L2 orbit and why is it important? and Why is it good for astronomy? Let's uh, take a look. So the, uh, the, the L2 is one of uh, five Lagrange points which uh, uh, exist in any three body system where you have two, ma two large masses and, and one small one. In the case of us, we're talking about the Earth, the Sun uh, and our satellite. Uh, what happens is that the Earth's gravity uh, pulls at things in these regions and changes the orbital velocity from what you'd expect. So here's a diagram showing the five um, Lagrangian points in the Earth-Sun system. Uh, we have L1, which is on a direct line between the Earth and the Sun. We have L3, which is on that line, but extended through the Sun to the Earth's orbit on the other side. We have two L4 and L5. These are the so-called Trojan points, which uh, those of you who know anything about Jupiter will know that there are large numbers of asteroids in the Jupiter Trojan points. And then we have L2, uh, which is on the Earth-Sun line, but away from the Earth, on the uh, outward so out, on outward line, about a million and a half kilometers from the Earth. Now, what's happening here is normally something at L1 it's interior to the Earth's orbit, so it should travel faster than the Earth. It should accelerate away and leave the Earth behind. But the Earth's gravity kind of tugs it and pulls it back and slows it down. So it keeps anything in the L1 uh, point uh, on that line between the Earth and the Sun. Similarly, anything placed at L2, it's further away from the Earth. So its orbital period around the Sun should be longer than the Earth. And so it should gradually be left behind by the Earth. But the Earth's gravity pulls on this thing and drags it along with the Earth. So stuff that's put, anything that's put in the L2 region or close to the L2 region is dragged along by the Earth's gravity and maintains that position on the Earth's sun line uh, outbound. L1 is a good place to put solar monitoring missions because they constantly seize the sun. Um, these L4 and L5 uh, Trojan points were favored by uh, large space colony concepts, which were popular in the 19. Uh, 70s, huge space colonies where giant solar power stations would be built. Um, and L2 turned out to be an excellent place uh, for astronomy. Uh, for one thing, if you're sitting in L2 or in, a, in, a, in an orbit which is orbiting the L2 point, uh, the Sun, the Earth and the Moon are all on the same side of you. So uh, any, if you have a sunshade, it, it blocks the light from both the Sun and the Earth and the Moon. Uh, it's a very stable environment. The sunlight is constant. The earth light is constant. Uh, so you have a very stable environment of, of, for your heat shielding. Uh, and also most of the sky is not obstructed by the sun or the earth. So you can point over much of the sky uh, without large uh, constraints to avoid the earth or the sun. And as the earth goes around the sun and the L2 point follows it around, even regions which are hidden by the sun at launch gradually become available. So as this Earth-Sun line rotates, uh, you get to see the whole sky over a period of some months. And you can always see the polar regions because the sun is never close to those lines. Um, it's mostly used for pointed missions, but it's also suitable for surveys. The most recent mission to be put there uh, is the Erosita e experiment on the uh, Spectrum Rogen Gamma mission, which was launched quite recently. Uh, L2 is not perfect. There's uh, always compromises in all of these things. So the downside of it 
is that it's quite a long way away. So you require large launches to get you there, uh, typically uh, Ariane 5s or something similar. Um, or you have to have a complicated lunar swing by to generate uh, extra gravitational energy to throw you out there. Uh, the position is only semi-stable because the Earth-Sun system does not exist in isolation. There are other planets and their gravity, uh, it's weak, but it's there and it affects these things. So the position is only semi-stable. So you do need to use uh, thruster power to maintain yourself in position. And actually that's the, often the limiting lifetime is the thruster fuel to keep yourself in the right position. Because it's further away from the Earth, you need more communications power, you need bigger antenna or more powerful transmitters. Uh, and of course, going back to almost where we came in, uh, this is far too far away from the Earth to be reached by the space shuttle or its equivalent. Uh, and so you can't service or repair missions once you send them to L2. Nonetheless, there are several missions which are currently in that location or have used that location. The two on the left are uh, Planck and the WMAP uh, mission. These were both uh, surveys of the cosmic microwave radi cosmic radiation background, the microwave background, which is the thermal echo of the Big Bang. Uh, these missions, I think, are now both uh, finished. The uh, big picture in the center is Spectrum Rontgen Gamma, which is the recent multinational mission led by the Russians, where the Erosita is, is sitting. The picture bottom center is Herschel, which was a large submillimeter observatory uh, launched by Europe cryogenically cooled uh, with a radiatively cooled telescope. Uh, that mission is now defunct because the uh, cryogens ran out. The top right hand corner is the Gaia satellite. Gaia is a sky mapper, which is sweeping across the sky uh, every day, measuring the positions of stars with fantastic accuracy. Um, and that's allowing us to build up an archeological uh, history of our own galaxy because it's so accurate that over a period of a few years, the stars have moved enough for you to figure out where they've come from and where they're going to. Uh, it also does lots of other uh, monitoring things. And the big guy in the bottom right is the James Webb Space Telescope. This is a flagship astronomy mission which is due for launch late next year. Uh, it's a huge infrared telescope. The telescope itself is 6.5 meters in diameter. Now, if you don't think meters, 6.5 meters is about the gable end of a detached two-story house. So this is a huge telescope um, and it sits on a, a six layer heat shield of uh, aluminium, of mylar gold, gold foil, which is the size of a tennis court. Uh, and that's to protect the telescope from the heat from the sun uh, and the earth. So uh, James Webb's due for launch in about just a little bit over a year's time. Uh, and it hopefully have a 10 year mission doing uh, infrared astronomy at a, level of sensitivity, which is far beyond anything you can do from the Earth and far beyond anything that's been done uh, from space already. So for those of you who uh, want to keep this stuff uh, in your head, this is a slide that was in a paper by uh, John Farrow and in the first of our conferences about this radiatively cooled Edison telescope. Um, and it's just a table which shows you the advantages and disadvantages of various types uh, of orbits, for, particularly for astronomy. And finally, uh, is the pub quiz slide. Uh, I've talked about apogee and perigee. Now, you might think that something around the moon, you would just say lunar apogee or lunar perigee. But that wouldn't make sense, really, because the G in apogee is the G of the Earth. It's the same G as you get geography and geology. Uh, so strictly, something in orbit around the moon has different labels. And those are either perisynthian or perilune. And you might think, well, what's the difference? Why are the two? Um, and the answer is that we use perisynthian for an orbit around the moon of a spacecraft that's been launched from somewhere else. So the picture on the left is the lunar orbiter, which was launched from the Earth and then placed into orbit around the moon. Uh, whereas the picture on the right is the ascent stage of the Apollo 17 uh, lunar module, Challenger. Um, now this was launched from the moon surface. So, so its orbit is an apolune and a perilune rather than a perisynthian and aposynth. And we use similarly different words for the other planets. So apsis, periapsis is an orbit around Mars, perijove is an orbit around Jupiter. And there will be other uh, similar definitions of orbitals around other planets. And that's pretty much 
all I wanted to say. Uh, I should thank uh, various people. Most of the photographs come from NASA and the European Space Agency. Some of the slides uh, were based uh, from the other ATC. I work at the Astronomy Technology Center, but I also teach with the Air Training Corps. Uh, and some of these slides were from the Air Training Corps uh, lessons on satellite communications. Uh, that IRAS orbit and the uh, Iridium crash animation uh, was from uh, Analytic Graphics. Uh, they have a, a software package uh, which you can download and try for free. And that's what I used to make those movies. So uh, that's the end. I hope you found that interesting. Uh, there'll be an opportunity to answer questions on a live stream at some point in the near future. Um, hope you found that interesting. And uh, if you have been, thanks for listening.